Hi guys, Nain here, and welcome. People looking in the window, it's really awkward. Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to the latest instalment in my bookshelf tour. So we're on H today. We're doing like three shelves today of a thinner bookcase. So yeah, there is that. And um, without further ado, let's just get started. Now I already know it's a problem. Having said three shelves, I think I'm just going to do the first two shelves because I worked it out and I think each of those bookcases... It doesn't matter. I'm trying to explain this badly. Each of them has the equivalent to like three shelves. And they have six shelves. I'm going to do two shelves. <laughs> How many times can I say the word shelf? I don't know. Alright, let's... Where, where, where do we begin? We begin with this. Death's Dance by Crimson Heart. Deadly, Deathly Encounters Book 1. Being a psychic, you would think talking to the dead was a walk in the park. However, it's not always that simple. And this is an indie release... I'm guessing YA. I can't quite remember. I wasn't really using terms like YA and whatnot back when I read it. Um, but yes, yeah, she approached me through my book blog. I read it. It was enjoyable enough. All right, here we have Jason Harvey. Achieve anything in just one year. Be inspired daily to live your dreams and accomplish your goals. It is basically a generic self-help book. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say about it. I, I read it. It was okay. I don't know whether... Well, I mean, I did end up quitting my job and going self-employed and quitting smoking and go vegan and stuff. So, I guess I did that. I don't know if I did it in one year, though. Here we have Paula Hawkins, The Girl on the Train. I wasn't a fan of it, but I did think the book was better than the movie. I don't know why the movie randomly changed the country it was set in. Well, I do. It's because it was made by Americans. It's one of those things, isn't it? It's that, that genre of book that is suddenly coming out and everyone's gobbling up. So, I figured I, I ought to read along. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't as good as Gone Girl, and I didn't like Gone Girl. Here we have some Stephen Hawking books. So we have Stephen Hawking, A Brief History of Time, From the Big Bang to Black Holes. This is his most famous book, you know, non-fiction about how the universe works, basically, and, again, how time works. And this is the first one of his that I read. I've also read Black Holes and Baby Universes and other essays. This one's actually fascinating because... You know, he talks about things like his illness and whatnot. Stop beeping at me. Uh, yeah, his childhood, Oxford and Cambridge, my experience with ALS. And then we get on to, is the end in sight for theoretical physics? The quantum mechanics of black holes. Is everything determined? And then his Desert Island Discs interview. So that was pretty cool. And then we have Lucy and Stephen Hawking, George's secret key to the universe. Includes the latest ideas about black holes. So this is basically like a children's story that teaches you a little bit about science and space by proxy. I only read it about a year ago. It was pretty good. Okay, here we have Stephen Hawking and Leonard Mlodinov, The Grand Design. Now, picking this up right now, the thing that strikes me immediately is this is a very heavy book for, like, what it is. This is hev This is heavier than this, I would say. Or... No, I think this is heavier. That's crazy. Um, new quest new answers to the ultimate questions of life. This is actually one of the more recent ones that I've read, and I don't particularly remember it, but, um, I mean, it's Hawking. He's an intelligent man. From Hawking to Hawks, so this is Tony Hawks, Round Island with a Fridge. This isn't Tony Hawk, the skater. It's Tony Hawks, the sort of comedian and writer, I suppose. And he literally went around Ireland with a fridge. My copy's a bit battered, but, um, you know. For example, here is his fridge. So he hitchhiked around Ireland while taking the fridge everywhere with him. As you do. Yeah. And this is my friend Neil, one of his favourite books. Then we have Beth Hayden, Pinfluence, The Complete Guide to Marketing Your Business with Pinterest. And I picked this up back when I used to work in social media marketing. It's only about 190 pages. This edition wouldn't necessarily hold up well now, but I'd, I would imagine there's probably like a more up-to-date edition out there. And if you want to use Pinterest to you know, build traffic to a website, pretty good book to get. Okay, then we have all of my Ladybird books, but these are by, um, who are they by? They are by, it's a JP, they're by JP Morris and J.A. Hazley. So here we have How It Works, The Cat. I'll read you a line from each. House cats belong to the same family as lions, cheetahs and leopards. When the council find out where this family lives, they will almost certainly want to have a word. Here we have the lady, how it works, the dad. 
and our line from this. He cannot admit it to his wife, but Simon's twins are starting to freak him out. How it works, the grandparent. Since turning 60, Diane has had new teeth, an artificial hip, a plastic knee, and surgery to replace the lenses in her eyes. As a young woman, Diane never liked doctors much, but she is a different person these days. Probably because so many bits of her have been replaced. How it works, the husband. In Japan, you can buy a robot husband. This is M1, a fully motorised electronic husband. He can move furniture, barbecue, clear gutters, carve roast dinners, install TVs, kick and catch balls, and is even programmed to apologise. Sadly, scientists cannot work out how to stop him burping. How it works, the student. I've been one of these. University accommodation can be small, so the student does not need to bring a lot of things from home. Nina has measured her room and designed some handmade furniture that fits just right. Okay, here we have the Ladybird Book of Red Tape. Roth works for the Department of Transport. It is his job to typeset and handprint vellum copies of all driving licenses. These are stored in a slate quarry in Neath. Roth's job has not been necessary since the reign of James II, but is covered by some very complex dismissal legislation. The Ladybird Book of the Hipster. This is a poster for an event combining scratch cinema and a live performance by the East London Clapping Orchestra. If you look carefully at it, you can see none of the details. The Ladybird Book of the Shed. Roland is spending Easter in the shed, sorting his screws. While his wife and children visit his mother, Roland is separating his screws into flathead, Phillips, posi drive, countersunk, double countersunk, bugle head, round head, clutch head, button head, pan head, hex head, flange head, phil philister head, and miscellaneous. There are also boxes for washers, hooks, pins, and a bag for fluff. It needed doing, says Roland. And then the Ladybird Book of the Zombie Apocalypse. The Walking Dead spend a lot of time bashing themselves against windows. Maybe it is all the flies in their brains. Okay, next up we have booktube sensation, Charlie Heathcote, also known as Charles Heathcote. We have R. Doris and Indisputably Doris here. Two indie novels by a booktuber slash author tuber. And I will put my hand on heart and say they are probably two, well, definitely... Almost definitely, because I don't want to offend other people, but they're almost definitely the two best indie books I've read this year. Okay, then we have Shane Hegarty. We have It's About to Get Legendary, Darkmouth, and Darkmouth Worlds Explode. And these are just sort of, yeah, like YA middle grade books here. Uh, I, I really enjoyed these, actually. Legends, also known as terrifying human-eating monsters, have invaded the world. But don't panic, the last legend hunter, Finn, will protect us. Finn, 12 years old, loves animals, not a natural fighter, but tries really, really hard. And we all know good intentions are the best weapons against a hungry minotaur, right? On second thoughts, panic. Panic now! Then we have E.B. Heimdall, The Dawn of Sky, book one of the Sunday children. Sky and her twin brother Echo struggle to survive in a world without grown-ups. That's all I'm going to read from this one, because I don't remember it, I'm sorry. Alright, we continue. So, uh, here we have John Hegley. Beyond Our Kennel, poetry basically by John Hegley is fairly well known, I would say. Actually, a lot of people have always told me I should enjoy John Hegley. And uh, I thought he was alright, but it wasn't amazing, but worth reading at some point. I will read you a poem. This is Some Resolutions. Some resolve to give up on the smoking. Some resolve to cut out all the meat. Some resolve to get their trunks more regularly soaking. And some resolve to stop all the deceit. Some resolve to solve financial problems by taking up a life involving crime. And some resolve to give their aging parents more than just the fag end of their time. Some resolve to have a hobby. Some resolve to join a lobby. Some resolve to clear up every jobby that their doggy does and not go hosepipe crazy in the drought. And some of the aforesaid solutions dissolve before the Christmas tree has been put outside the door, especially resolutions one and four. Here we have Zoe Heller, a notes on a scandal, good movie, good book. Basically, that's all I have for it. It's about a teacher who has an affair with one of her students, told through the eyes of her friend. Okay, here we have Hemingway. We're on to the Hemingway collection, so I'm not going to dwell on them too much, but we have A Farewell to Arms, which is a war book, so I enjoyed it for that. 
We have A Movable Feast. This is about his time in Paris, uh, meeting people like Ezra Pound, Wyndham Lewis, James Joyce, Ford, Maddox Ford, Gertrude Stein, F. Scott Fitzgerald and others. And, yep, one of his best. Here we have a Byline, which is basically like his collected journalism. It's all right. I mean, it's his collected journalism. We have Fiesta, The Sun Also Rises. Uh, this is like, it says here, the novel that established him as a writer of genius. It was all right. Don't remember it too much. The Fifth Column. This is sort of set in Madrid during the Spanish Civil War. Again, I like anything to do with wars. I find them interesting, even though I'm a pacifist. Maybe it's so that because I'm trying to find ways to avoid them in the future. Here we have The Garden of Eden, his final novel. Yeah. Don't remember it. We have The Old Man and the Sea, which is the first one that I read. It was alright, but... Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's his best, controversially. It almost put me off Hemingway, but then I read some of his other books and enjoyed them. Here we have Ernest Hemingway, The Torrents of Spring, a romantic novel in honour of the passing of a great race. Alright. A lot of these I read a long time ago as well. To Have and Have Not. I'd even forgotten this was a Hemingway novel, but yes. Read this. Don't remember it, sorry. Winner Take Nothing. Uh, yeah, Hemingway. Super memorable. But he's one of those authors, to be fair, who I enjoy at the time. And I'm not too worried if I don't remember them. If anything, that means I can reread Hemingway in my... Stop pinging. If anything, that means I can reread Hemingway in my uh, retirement without being spoiled. So, yay. Here we have The Bookshop That Floated Away by Sarah Henshaw. Basically, Sarah Henshaw used to be the proprietress of the book barge. It was a real-life barge here in the UK. I actually went to it one time, and I interviewed her. In fact, this is probably signed. Is it signed? Yeah. To Dane at socialbookshelves.com. Live by the book. Love, Sarah. And, um... Yeah, she used to be like a, an entertainment journalist, quit a job, bought a barge, turned it into a bookshop, lived on that for a while. The barge is now outside. I think she's living with her boyfriend or husband. I think it's the boyfriend actually who's in this book. Because um, obviously it's not easy to live with somebody who lives on a bloody bookshop barge. <laughs> but, but um, you know, they had their ups and downs, but I think they're still together, living in France now. And she's like floated the barge across the English Channel. So that's pretty cool. Then we have Poems on the Underground, edited by Jared Benson, Judith Cherniak, and Cicely Herbert. And basically, here on the Underground, the London Underground, we have like poems quite often. And so this is just like an anthology that brings together some of the poetry that was included. Here we have June by Frank Herbert. So I read this finally in January of this year as part of Junior with some booktube people including Mindy's Book Journey. Uh, who else read it? Plots and Points was in on it. I think Graham Quigley did it. I can't remember. It was a long time ago now. It was good, though. I enjoyed it. Here we have Philip Herriot, Magic Mystery, The Mind Master. Find the clues and solve the mystery. So this is like a choose-your-own-adventure book. But what I liked about this, it's also illustrated. And it's like this... It follows like this psychiatrist basically who's accused of like brainwashing his um, his clients into like robbing banks and stuff. Here we have A Revolution in the Valley by Andy Hertzfeld, co-creator of the Mac. The insanely great story of how the Mac was made. And if you're a bit of an Apple geek, you've probably heard of Hertzfeld. He actually kept a blog and uh, where he wrote about like all of the all of the pr production of the Mac or whatever. Obviously he didn't write the blog at the time. I think he wrote the blog in the 2000s, and then this book basically pulls together all of those blog posts into chronological order and just tells the story of how the Mac was created. So yeah, I'm not necessarily a big Mac fanboy, but um, I I am interested in computing and like computing history and stuff. So all right, here we have Arik Hirsch, MBE, a detail of history, the harrowing true story of a boy who survived the Nazi Holocaust. This was sent to me. Which kind of made it more poignant, if that makes sense. Because, I mean, the guy who wrote this legit survived the Holocaust. The Holocaust as well, you could call it that, I suppose. Here is 100 Months by John Hicklinton. Now, this is really quite disturbing. Um, yeah. So, this is a graphic novel. 
John Hickleton took his own life in 2010 with Dignitas in Zurich. He had multiple multiple sclerosis. And basically, this is the last 100 months of his life. He worked on this graphic novel. And uh, as you can tell, it gets pretty dark. If you like, like really dark, thought-provoking graphic novels, you will enjoy this. And I mean, look at that art style. Blurred by Neil Gaiman on the back. I was lucky. I was lucky enough to have Johnny Hicklinton draw my first published story. So there we go. Speaking of Neil Gaiman, he blurbed this one as well. <laughs> he said, "I loved it unreservedly." About Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill, which I read earlier this year. Absolutely love. Four and a half out of five. Only stop pinging. It's the only Joe Hill book that I've read so far. Sorry, I'm trying to stop my computer from pinging. It's the only Joe Hill book that I have read so far, but I really enjoyed it, and I will definitely be getting to more of his work. From Joe Hill to Susan Hill, The Woman in Black. Again, this is the only Susan Hill book that I've read. Again, I've really enjoyed it. I have heard some things about Susan Hill afterwards, like nothing concrete, just people that I respect, saying that they met her and didn't like her, and that she was quite snobbish towards them. So... That makes me not want to read more of her books, but I do have one up there uh, on my TBR shelf that I'll get to eventually. Here we have Jeff Hilson, the Reality Street Book of Sonnets. So these are all Eric. Spe er uh, so these are all experimental sonnets. Jeff Hilson was one of my lecturers at university as well. Let me see if I have acknowledgments. Do we have an index? Here we go. I'm going to read you Jeff Hilson's sonnet in this. So these aren't sonnets as you would know sonnets. They're a modern poetry take on sonnet. In fact, I'm just going to take the opening line. And with my whoso list, as if we are walking in a Norman forest. Sometimes I think we all need a little forest glossary, so that game might be driven towards us. They fled with my dole, hey, that's my share of the countryside. Give them thy finger in the forêt de Nancy, into the countryside with my dole. Or let them roll, or let them roam on lonely moats. A vast moat beautifies where she is going. Is where she is going far. So yeah, experimental stuff, but worth worth reading for me at least, because he was my uh, lecturer at uni, like I said. Here we have Barry Hines, A Kestrel for a Knave. It says Kez here, because that's this is the movie version of it, or whatever. The copyright 1968. We studied this in school. It's basically about a northern lad who's getting quite badly bullied, and he has a pretty crappy life. And he, he tames this kestrel, and it's really sad. Then we have S.E. Hinton, The Outsiders. I would say A Kestrel for a Knave is almost like our British version of The Outsiders, almost. I mean, it's not about gangs or anything like that, but it was published at a similar time and sort of told that story of the, you know, the, the disenfranchised youth, you know, the kids who have to look after themselves and maybe don't have the best parents and no money and stuff. So uh, if you liked one, I would suggest checking out the other. But anyway, Essie Hinton, The Outsiders, really enjoyed it. Read it earlier this year when we were visiting Oxford. That is it for this bookshelf tour because the final book on this shelf will we'll start the next one because it's part of a, an indie author who I own a few books by. But yeah, we are getting into the H's. I'm really enjoying these tours still. Hopefully you guys are still enjoying them. I know they don't get as much interaction as maybe some of my other videos. But also they're super useful for me because I'm writing my memoirs. And the way I'm writing my memoirs is that I'm telling my life in books through the books that I've read. So it helps to just have a, you know, easy to access alphabetized list of all of the books that I've read. Which I get from putting together the descriptions. So yeah, all the books talked about are in the description below as well. So, on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and we can have a little chat about them. Hit that subscribe button if you'd like to see more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.